Welcome to the Secure Connections podcast, sponsored by IOTSA, the Internet of Things Security Services Association. I'm Brian Sherman, Content Director for IOTSA and your host today. And joining me is a special guest that we had on a few months back uh, to discuss liability in the cybersecurity space, attorney Bradley Gross. In addition to his role as founder and president of the Law Office of Bradley Gross, he is a noted speaker and author on a variety of tech-related legal topics. Welcome back to the Secure Connections podcast, Brad. Thanks. Nice to be here. Well, good. I'm glad I caught you at home. I know right now in the COVID-19 thing, everybody's at home. But uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you could start every podcast yes. now through the month with, with that, right? Yes, uh, it's uh, a serious topic, but at the same point, yeah, I know everybody's getting a little stir crazy. But uh, well, let me start off with uh, how are you and your family faring during the COVID-19? Doing well, doing well. We're all uh, quarantined, hunkered down. Uh, I have my masks in case I go out. Uh, I would say that the only, uh, thank God, you know, we, everyone is happy and healthy and safe. And uh, uh, the only thing I can tell you that I did the experiment with is, you know, all the, um, all the uh, salons and barbershops are all shut down. So my daughter gave me a haircut about a week ago. It grew back in, which is why I agreed to do a video. <laughs> Just saying. Just Look. throwing that out there. It looks good. I'm glad I went a couple yes. weeks ago. Yeah, I haven't had to go yet, so I'm still safe. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll see me in about two more weeks. Yeah, That's I'll, right. I'll look better like, end soon. Or you know, I'll look gonna... like uh, I'm in the '70s uh, version of uh, of uh, half of the TV shows where my hair. A whole different kind of interview. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it'll change. But uh, awesome to have you today. So um, I know you, we were talking about some of the issues, and today we want to talk a little about the COVID nineteen and how how that's changed the legal environment and the liability environment for MSPs. Um, and l- let me start off with one, and this came actually from an advisory panel. Uh, we've got cases where IT service providers are still sending techs into the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially those that are supporting some essential businesses like emergency services, law enforcement, hospitals, doctors, sure. they got to have their tech. They have to have things operating. We understand that point. Um, though they're concerned about their employees being exposed to COVID-19, some organizations and municipalities still need on-site services. I think we're, we're seeing that now. And MSPs are being asked to send their people out. What are the MSPs' legal responsibilities and liabilities in these types of situations? Well, MSPs still have to follow the same rules that every other company has to follow. They have to follow the rules from OSHA. They have to follow state and, and, and local laws. But, but generally speaking, the rule is that you can't send a worker into an area that is likely to cause either death, obviously, or serious bodily harm. Now, obviously, that there are, there are some jobs, not necessarily MSP related, that require that. Okay? You know, people work on electric lines and so on, but they, they take that risk on when they accept those jobs. MSPs and their tech workers usually don't take those risks on. So the question is, by sending a tech out into the field, are you sending a tech into something that exposes the tech to serious bodily injury or potential death? Um, I think that while the courts will examine this in the next months, years, and so forth, retrospectively looking back, uh, they haven't done so yet, at least not in this area, in the technology area. My two cents, I don't think at this point we are ready to say that sending a tech out into the field will per se expose the tech to either potential death or serious bodily injury. Now, you'd say, well, you know, isn't that why there are quarantines? Aren't there quarantines because there could be potential injury? And the answer is yes, but largely quarantines are to limit uncontrolled situations. People gathering together, you know, 5, 10, 15, 30, 100 people all in one place and so forth. Techs can control that situation. Techs can control the situation that they're going into by limiting their distance from others, or instructing others that they're going to have to step away so the tech can do his or her work. I would also suggest in any event that any employer who's sending a tech out into the field provide the tech with at least reasonable gear to accommodate the situation. And what might that be? Mask, right? Gloves. I'm not saying that you have to provide the tech a hazmat suit. What I am saying is that 
There are reasonable precautions that anyone should be taking, including techs. And I think that as long as employers do that, I am not ready to interpret the law. And I don't think any judge has interpreted the law as you're sending a tech out into the field with the coronavirus out there. That's violating an OSHA rule. Or that's violating an employment law. Uh, I don't see it yet. Yeah. And in many cases, I've seen the precautions were mentioned too, as we're giving them masks, mm -hmm. we're giving them gloves, uh, giving them the sanitizers and other things, even for getting back in the vehicle uh, covers. Even I've seen either keyboard covers or where they're sending them into the field with actual keyboards and mice, their own that right. are protected and sanitized too. So if they're following right. those rules, I, I can understand. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that employers now have, uh, you know, uh, the ability to say, oh, well, we heard this podcast, so uh, we'll just send the text out. I'm not suggesting yeah. that. But what I am suggesting is that if we're just talking from a strictly legal perspective, mm -hmm. it would be very difficult, first of all, for a tech to say, I got a virus because you sent me out on this day at this time. Very difficult in light of all of the various sources where they could contract the virus from. Uh, but I do think that at the very least, in order to eliminate that argument eliminate the possibility. And by the way, it makes good business sense, mm -hmm. right? To send your tech out with the gear that is reasonably required to allay fears. Right. I think that makes good business sense. It's probably the right thing ethically to do as well. Yeah. And I'm seeing that in many cases where the owners have the technical expertise to do it, many of them are going out themselves rather than sending employees out. But some are doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but here's the question too, is, is we talked about where it's emergency services and required. What about if I'm an MSP and I just have some new installs that we want to get done and we need the revenue right. and we're worried about that? Do you think that differentiates it as well as far as liability? If it's something they could put off for a month or two months, do you, what, do you, what does, do you think the legal standing is around that? Is it something they should definitely wait for? Yeah, I think that what you're bringing up is not so much a legal issue as much as a business decision. So yeah. while Or ethical even. <laughs> or ethical even, yeah. right. Admittedly, it's very easy for... Um, people st sitting outside to say, oh, take a break, don't send your workers in, don't do these new, new installs and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you never know what kind of financial stress or financial situation the MSP is in. And everything is a balance test. I am not suggesting that you put human life over the business, but what I am suggesting is if you can minimize the risk to the point where you feel comfortable or your tech feels comfortable, right, and you balance that against the risk of not having that business in the future, you know, stimulus check aside, not having it in the future, I could see a business making a logical decision, a reasonably educated decision to say, I'm going to send myself in, or I'm going to send the tech in protected to the extent necessary, and we're going to see where it goes. I understand that, and I'm seeing a lot of that. Yeah, and it's not black and white. I think that's the one thing we realize is that things yeah. are, you know, there's situations where it may be the the end user that's really struggling and having issues. And, where you think it's something that could be just rudimentary, it's not. Um, let me talk to a number of IT service companies are providing their technicians um, with documentation. This is another question I had too. Right. I'm seeing this regularly in, in various areas. Like I'm in Pennsylvania. We had somebody that got arrested over the weekend. I saw it's actually in the county where my daughter lives um, because they were out and they were just joyriding. I think she just said the wrong thing. She's like, yeah, I'm just going for a drive. She didn't have a purpose. Uh, is this a requirement in states that they should have this documentation? And, uh, or is it just a good thing to have in case it gets stopped? Right now, as of the date that we're recording this, mm -hmm. uh, there is no legal requirement that I'm aware of that requires an essential worker to have documentation proving that he or she is essential. That said, it makes good business sense to have it. It would certainly make law enforcement's job easier, and it would allay the fears of everybody uh, when they are stopped and pulled over. You know, am I going to be questioned? Am I going to have uh, people called? Are they going to sort of detain me while we straighten this out? To have that documentation is a recommended thing, but it is not a requirement as we speak. Gotcha. Very good advice. What information should be, is there any information that you can recommend that should be included in these type of documents and who should provide or sign these papers? Is, are you seeing any state, local governments have them or is it typically just from the owner? Are we seeing, I didn't catch that last question. 
I said, who are providing or signing these papers? Is it, uh, should it come from a government official? I haven't seen any official government ones, but is it typically just from the business owner? And Yeah, I haven't issues? seen any, I haven't seen any government papers either. Generally speaking, it's employers who issue these letters. And the way it works is the employer will issue it on its letterhead with a date, with a, um, uh, the person's full name, contact address. I recommend that the contact address be exactly the same as whatever is on that person's license so they can match them up, right? Um, it also will usually provide a contact number, telephone number of the company in case the officer, let's say in this case, wants to check up, wants to make sure that this is not a fraud or, you know, someone's not just messing around. You have a contact number for the company, they call it, yes, this is an essential worker, so on, and then you're free to go. Now, admittedly, again, this is all sort of a prophylactic measure because I'm unaware of police officers just randomly stopping people and saying, are you an essential worker and so on. I think that uh, what could happen more realistically is you commit some sort of traffic infraction, right? You're a, you, don't make a, you don't signal when you make a turn. You run a red light uh, unintentionally or something, you're speeding. And that gives the officer the opportunity to look into it. At that point, you don't want to aggravate the traffic infraction by also not being an unessential worker. So these types of documents signed by the employer with a contact number, have the addresses match up, are very important in, this, in these times. Gotcha. So that's probably the time you don't want to be a jerk to, to the person pulling you over, I would imagine, because I think that's what happened in this case. Probably not, yeah. Is, uh, Probably not the time to uh, yeah, yeah. to laugh and make fun of the officer and so on. Who's who's as concerned about mm -hmm. you potentially infecting him or her, right? That's true. As you are nervous about being pulled over. So yeah. at that point, tensions are high, and when tensions are high in any situation, um, you want to de-escalate as quickly as possible. Yeah. I'm even seeing that across the world too. I was in, uh, I have a friend that was following on Facebook last night who was doing all of his service calls Sunday nights because there were less people around and they gave him access to the building so that he could uh, avoid other people and avoid people mm -hmm. on the road. And he took some interesting pictures around, uh, around London um, about how quiet it was too. So it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of eerie. It, it's very eerie, but you know, people are just doing what they can do. And I guess that's your point, too, is if you're doing things mindfully and trying to respect things, chances are they'll look the other way if there's a, you know, some sort of infraction. But Yeah, I mean, I, you know, and just going a bit off topic uh, for, for a moment, I, I was a prosecutor for many years in two different states. So I worked with law enforcement all over the country. And, uh, you know, what I've learned in that uh, experience is that law enforcement, let's say police officers, they're people like you and me. They have families. They want to go home to their family. They want to see their kids at the end of the day, maybe before they leave for work as well. They don't want to have somebody who's a jerk. They don't want to have somebody, uh, you know, coughing in their face. They don't want to contract the disease. So de-escalation in these periods of time should be emphasized. And one of the ways, now bringing it back to our, you know, our, our, our paradigm here, um, one of the ways to de-escalate is to have those kind of papers, right? Officer, you know, I appreciate you pulling me over. People are crazy around here, they're driving around. Let me show you what I'm doing. You know, I work for so-and-so, essential business. Here are my papers, feel free to call them. 99% of the time, they won't call. <laughs> they're not gonna call, at least I okay. feel they won't, but it's good to have it, for sure. Gotcha. Cover your bases. So let me switch a little bit too now, because uh, you've last time we had you on, we talked about the services SLA agreements, and uh, yeah. you know a lot of that stuff's up in the air right now because MSPs are worried are our clients going to be able to pay. They're they're turning down licenses. I've seen a number of online discussions about clients requesting MSPs either defer or reduce their monthly payments, and mm -hmm. talk to a few um, that are going through similar situations. The the Many of them, I think, are just looking for compassionate advice, but what's a provider's legal standing in these situations? Well, you know, what, uh, what an MSP has to do legally and what a MSP should do are often two very different things. Now, legally, for example, if a customer comes to the MSP and says, um, force majeure, 
I can't, this is an act of God. And as a result, I can't pay you or I shouldn't have to pay you and so on. I could tell you that virtually all of the time, virtually, maybe there's a small percentage out there where it does, I mean, 1% of the time, right? Um, 99% of the time, what we are going through now is not a force majeure. It is not. First of all, pandemics are usually excluded, but even if they weren't excluded, even if they weren't, if what we are going through now is an economic downturn due to the virus. It is an economic downturn that virtually every court who has examined the issue has said does not qualify as an act of God. When you're dealing with two parties to a contract, the idea is the parties are supposed to anticipate economic downturns and do whatever they have to do on their, on their own end to accommodate them. But an economic downturn in and of itself, even if it's caused by a pandemic, is not a force majeure. Now, what might be a force majeure? Well, let's say uh, the scenario is quarantined and an MSP could not, could not deliver a service to a community because it was quarantined, it was shut down. No one in, no one out. That's a force majeure, right? It becomes an impossibility. If it is an impossibility, it's a force majeure. And the same goes, by the way, with the customers. If the customer of an MSP faces an impossibility, not necessarily just due to lack of customers, well, that might be a force majeure. So legally, to answer your question, um, MSPs are not required to let their customers out of contracts based on what we're seeing now. Okay, that said, should they? Should they make accommodations? I think that if you're able to, you should. It makes good business sense too. Assuming that you are financially able to delay implementation or delay payment, receipt of payment, right? Delay that AR. Um, you're going to get a customer for life because the customer is going to remember what you did when times were not good. And you could remind the customer of that. Um, you might, and there are different ways to do it. You could say, listen, we're still going to provide you the service, but we're not going to forgive or waive this month. We'll tack it on to the end. All right. Our 36 month now became a 37 month. If this goes for a month after that, it becomes a 38 month contract. There are ways to accommodate it. And I think MSP should because it makes good business sense to do so. That makes sense because I know um, what we're seeing in many cases is it's those clients that didn't want to pay you previously. And it's, it's managing the exception. I guess I'll go back to that point. You'll yeah. have companies right now that are actually doing better financially than they were before for whatever you know in reason industry that there's in but right. they utilize this as an excuse which is not an ethical thing to do on their side but on the msp side they're like what is my legal backing it's nice mm -hmm. to know that they have that and, and that's the case i think where they would use it is is what most what i'm seeing within the industry is they're using compassion to talk about individual situations case by case Right. To figure out what to do to work with the vendors. Many of the vendors are, are bending over backwards to see what they can do to help out in the situation too. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I've seen a lot of uh, customers of MSPs, at least initially client, try to claim act of God, force majeure and so forth. Okay. That should fall on deaf ears. Instead, I think what should be done is everyone should get together and say, okay, listen, I can provide you a service, maybe reduce the number of services, tack on extra months, maybe make up for it when all this gets worked out. But that's the approach that everyone should be taking, every MSP can, to the extent they're able to, right? To the extent they're able to. You know, at the end of the day, are they required to? No. Yeah, I think it goes back to the same thing is they want them to be long-term clients. Uh, mm -hmm. In most cases, you're going to work with them. But it's managing the exceptions. I think you run into with any, you know, any good or bad situation, you have, still have mm -hmm. to manage the exceptions. And that's where it's good to know at least they have the law at their back if they have okay. some contract in place. Um, what other legal issues should MSBs be concerned with during the COVID-19 pandemic? What things have come up in, in your world, Brad? What we are seeing a lot of is customers of, MS, of MSPs extending uh, the scope of the services or trying to extend the scope of services that they are offered, for example. Uh, your statement of work might say we're going to provide A, B, and C, but as your customer now distributes its workforce, its workforce begins to work from home, 
what we're finding is those customers are looking at the MSP and saying, well, you'll support my people from home, right? I mean, you'll support, you'll, you'll help us move them out of the office to their home and bring them back eventually. And, you know, you're going to help us um, uh, uh, move these applications onto their personal computers and so forth. And the MSPs in their zeal to keep the business and to keep the customer happy very often say, oh yeah, we'll do that. And then they're biting off more that they can chew. So what we're seeing is that project scope creep. It's, it's creeping, it's making it bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where the MSP turns around and says, uh-oh, now we're supposed to support 50 people from 50 different homes using personal equipment where before we were just going to support 50 workstations located at one you know, central location. So MSPs would be well advised to keep scope creep in mind and tell the customer not only what they need to do to distribute the workforce, but let them know there are costs involved in doing that. And while they'd be happy to do it, it's not something that's covered under the current document that was not anticipated, that doesn't fall within the scope of what the agreement is. That's the first thing. Okay. Second, second thing, uh, from an internal perspective, what MSP should be doing is reminding their own staff that as they are distributed themselves, that there are certain things that they must be doing consistent with the business operations, consistent with... Um, the way they would be acting if they were still in, in the office. For example, confidentiality, it's a big one. As MSP staff is distributed outward, they need to be reminded that things must be confidential, that you can't use personal email, that you can't use personal devices, that um, the confidentiality of the clients is not left at the front door of your house just because now you're quarantined inside of your house. So there are things like that, policies that the companies must be doing. And what we're finding is that a lot of MSPs are forgetting about that. They need to be reminded. Very good point. Let me, let me take, those are both good points. Let me go back to the, the scope creep. What's the best way to communicate that? Do they need to put that in writing for their clients? Email communications, is there any recommendation of making sure so that they can pull that I hate to say pull their scope back, but right. get back to normal after the situation resolves. Well, so there are two ways to do it. There's the proactive and the reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, and depending on how the MSP is going to handle things, you're going to handle it differently. So for example, proactive would be you send a letter out to your customers reminding them that as they you know, distribute their workforce, as they ask their, their employees to work from home, that the managed services that you're providing must be distributed to those locations. Now, right now, it's sort of limited to one location. If they want to distribute it, that is an additional scope. That's additional work. And if they want to have the MSP engage in those activities, well, you should invite a phone call. You should initiate a conference. But make it very clear that while you're willing to do it, it's outside the scope. That's proactive. Reactive, of course, is when the customer calls up and says, oh, listen, you know, these people are going home. You could do this, right? Don't be so quick to say yes. Sit back, have a discussion, take down the, the short-term goal, the long-term goal. Obviously, short-term is to send them out, out of the office. Long-term is to bring them back. So you have to think of both of those and have a discussion. Either way, the discussion has to happen. You're either going to do it proactively or reactively. And I believe that, and what we're finding is that the customers of MSPs are open to these things. They're open, but you know, their initial thought is not help me distribute my workforce and I'm ready to pay you to do it. Their initial thought is help me distribute my workforce. Your initial thought as the MSP is I can do that as long as you pay me to do it. So you have to sort of meet in the middle and figure out a way to do it. Clarity and, 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 and concise ways of putting things is the best way to do it. What about now? Because we're also assuming that by this point where we're at, many of these workforces have already been distributed. If they haven't had those discussions, is there something they can do reactively as an MSP now? You mean, uh, so we dropped out a little bit where you said is, I think you said, is there something that they could do reactively now, given that their workforce is distributed? Yeah. In most cases, the workforces are probably primarily already distributed in most locations sure. around the U.S. So if they haven't had those discussions at this point, what should they do? 
Well, you know, it's never too late to have the discussion uh, uh, to avoid any sort of project scope creep, right? So that's, you know, uh, cu the, the customers should have their expectations managed. And, you know, a lot of them may have just sent their work employees home, not even thinking about these types of issues. So the MSP could, you know, send out a reminder saying, hey, if you've already distributed your workforce, here are the three things that you need to pay attention to. Right? Here are three or four things that you may not have considered. Call us. Call us if you'd like to talk about them. From an internal perspective, MSPs might have already, like you said, sent their employees out, might have already distributed their workforce. So what should an employee, uh, an, uh, an MSP rather, do now? Never too late to send out affirmations. Never too late to look at agreements, state uh, service levels, and make sure that they're not promising something in writing that they're not going to be able to deliver this week or next week or the week after. Uh, you know, along those lines, um, we are, as a sort of a thank you for having us on this podcast, um, we're providing a free coronavirus audit. So anyone who is listening, any MSP who's listening to this broadcast, they could send us their documents, send us their MSA, their SLAs, their statements of work, maybe their internal response documents at how they're handling their employees. We'll give them a free hour consult and we'll take a look at their documents and, and let them know what we think they should or should not be doing as we move forward. Because I think this thing is gonna be with us for you know another month or two, and a lot of things can happen over the next two or, you know, one or two months. Um, and, and they're avoidable as long as you prepare for them, as long as you review the documents and make sure that they are really up to par and up to snuff for what we are experiencing right now. Very good. How can they get those uh, that information over to you, Brad? Sure. Well, they can either call the office, 954-217-6225, distributed workforce, but we have a central call center, so we'll get your call. Or they can uh, email us at info at bradleygross.com, info at B-R-A-D. L-E-Y-G-R-O-S-S dot com. Uh, we'd be happy to talk and just make sure they mention this, uh, this, this podcast. Very good. Yeah, I know. Um, and we think about what we've gone through the last few weeks. A lot of the MSPs consider it's more like the triage, like you saw in MASH. It's just getting people out the door because honestly, in some of the states and locations, they had like 48 to 72 hours to get these businesses closed and sent yeah, away. That's true. So, um, uh, and I'm sure a lot of things have slipped through, but now that hopefully they're getting caught up, they can go back. Maybe it's never too late to catch up. Yeah. You know, it's never, it's never too late to really, um, you know, to sit down and say, what service levels do we have out there? You know, yeah. you, you might have distributed your workforce today. And maybe you haven't had, had a problem, but tomorrow might be the problem, right? It's a, you know, a 99% chance of sun works unless you're the 1% that's getting rained on then it's 100% rain, right? So yeah. the idea is, is that um, just because you may have done the wrong thing or not prepared doesn't mean it's too late to prepare now yeah. or prepare for the next thing, you know? So, uh, you know, today it could be uh, uh, the coronavirus. Tomorrow could be a hurricane, right? There are always things that happen. And a lot of these, um, uh, these uh, known unknowns, like we know something's going to happen in the future, we just don't know what it is. These known unknowns need to be accommodated, and they can be. There's no reason not to accommodate them. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and I know it's a great time, you know, even to go back through now, and many MSPs are looking at how do I do, you know, going back through and doing testing their disaster plans now. Yeah. Now that things are settling down to go make sure is everything is everything connecting? Are we catching all the data from all of the remote workers right now? Have Absolutely. we have we audited all of the security, even maybe not penetration testing full, but at least doing some soft audits of where they're at or the situation. So legal wise might be a good good time to go back through and make sure. Agreed. Agreed. You know, now if you if you the, the headlines uh, uh, talk about hackers that are really targeting MSPs that have their attentions distracted elsewhere. And obviously these hackers are, are hitting MSPs because MSPs are direct vectors to their clients. Um, this is a good time to review incident response plans, internal incident response plans. What happens if we are hacked? Do we have uh, procedures in place? Do we have policies that we're going to follow? Do we have a computer emergency response team that's ready to go? 
These are the types of things that can happen and do happen when pandemics, when hurricanes, when bad things occur. And now is the perfect time to do it. And you'd say, well, we haven't been hacked, but you might, right? You might be tomorrow because this is the time when hackers are really aiming for you, the MSP. It's never too late to review your documents. It's never too late to do an internal audit. It is too late to do it after something bad has happened. Well, then it's too late. I mean, now you're just, you know, it's not a, uh, it just becomes a remediation effort at that point. So, Right. Be, be proactive even now. There's a lot of things you can do. That's so it. fantastic. Well, it's always great to have you, uh, have you on board uh, and have you in to talk. Um, any final thoughts to leave us uh, today before we close out the session? Well, I just think that um, everyone has to remain calm and try to do things as much as possible in the, in the way that things were done before this pandemic. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it's very easy for me to say, oh, just keep the, keep the faith and, and keep the, the ship sailing straight. Well, what I mean is this. There are certain things that we can control, and then there are things we can't. We can't control when the government says this area is quarantined. We can't mm -hmm. control it when it says you have to stay home and you're not going to work and businesses are shut down. We can't control that. But what can we control? We can control the way we're handling it. We can control the policies and procedures that we set up to handle these types of situations. And we can also control what our policies and plans are going to be when all this is over. Remember, this is going to end at some point. And you're still going to have to conduct a business. You're still going to need agreements. You're still going to need policies. You're still going to need procedures. So maybe this is the time to do that. Control what you can control. You can control your internal processes, then improve them. Now, you have the time, right? We're all home. We're all doing that. You have the time. Now is the time to do that. Make it efficient. Make, make this time effective. And I think that when we're out of this in a few weeks, you're going to come out even better. You're going to come out even more efficient. And that's sort of my hope for, for everyone listening to this, uh, to this podcast. Fantastic advice. Uh, again, thank you. On behalf of IOTSA, I uh, want to extend a sincere appreciation to attorney Brad Gross for joining us on this episode of the Secure Care Connections podcast. We want to wish everyone good health. Uh, please stop back and check out IOTSA.com for the latest resources, including those that are focused on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, especially around the secure, cybersecurity space. Uh, with that, I thank you for joining us and wish you to take care. Thank you. Take care.